Hi there, this is Jeff Kassman. Welcome to Tradition. And I want to welcome back to this episode, Jim DePianti, my friend, who's been on a long sabbatical. <laughs> sabbatical. <laughs> what yeah. have you been up to, Jim? I think the last time we heard from you, maybe before your Rome trip. I'm not sure. I think it was. It's been a considerable time. Yeah, I'm glad to be back. Glad to be back. Well, maybe we can get you to talk about your pilgrimage to Rome sometime. But oh, today, I would like that. Yeah, that would be great. So today, folks, we're going to be delving into a topic that has long been mentioned on this show and is frequently asked about in comments. We're going to talk about pagan origins. You've been clamoring for it. It's been keeping you up at night. You've been writing in our comments and in hate mail about it. So we're going to dive into it. So what is this all about? Well, Welcome to Tradition is a series of interviews that I conduct with other Catholics who are knowledgeable about the faith. We talk about liturgy. We talk about traditional practices and customs. We talk about the traditional doctrines, the faith that our ancestors had that is, in many respects, been lost in the last 60 years. Jim has been gone for a while. We've had a few other interesting conversations. I encourage you to check those out. Today, we are talking about pagan origins. Hmm. We've referenced this in previous episodes when we've talked about Halloween, for example, episode 20, or Christmas, episode 24. Today, we're also going to be including that conversation, Easter, and whether Easter is actually of pagan origins. So without further ado, let's, let's jump right into it. We often hear or see, especially on social media, especially in the Protestant United States, criticisms of Catholicism, because allegedly certain of our practices or beliefs have pagan origins. We even sometimes hear from well-meaning Catholics who are admonishing us to not do certain things because, you got it, pagan origins. So what do people really mean when they say that? Well, guess what? Jim has something to share with you. Jim, what's going on? Generally, folks mean that they're concerned that some Catholic belief or practice is derived from or influenced by some pagan belief or practice. Okay. So the first and easy way, obviously, I mean, how do we answer this criticism? Well, the, the, the first thing, the easy way, is you often enough they're wrong um the 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 charge that some thing or another has has pagan origins and we'll talk about some of those is just just balderdash um and, and so the easy answer is to say well actually no that particular thing doesn't have pagan origins so let, let's jump right into it is there an example that that you have that's commonly said to be a pagan origin probably the one that draws the most engagement on social media is halloween um and this is mainly due to this rabid anti-catholic nut job pamphleteer by the name of jack chick so protestants denounce catholics for their observance of halloween and it, it, it seems, uh, from my experience here in, in the South, and and also our, our conversations on this show and on social media, that many times it's it's conservative Catholics who are the worst at this. They 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 renounce Halloween and 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 then go further to denounce other Catholics for observing it. Um, that these people insist that Halloween comes from the pagan pagan celebration of Sam Hain. I don't know. Hey, what do you say? So so Sam Hain is essentially a harvest festival. Right? The date of Halloween was established so that it would take place after the harvest. It had actually originally been in May, but the church moved it because in an agrarian society, like the farmers were busy in May. That's like the planting season. And so they moved the celebration of All Saints Day and thus the, the celebration of Halloween until after the harvest. So we have this pagan celebration and this Christian celebration coinciding. 
but they're both based on the harvest. There's, there's just no causal relationship between the two. They actually share a common cause, which is the harvest. In any case, Christians were celebrating Halloween for like centuries before there even was such a thing called Samhain. Yeah, so the Catholic holiday preceding Samhain would seem to kind of resolve that one. So we can we can falsify that claim. But what if there what if there really is a relationship between a pagan practice and a Catholic practice? Then what do we say? We say, and listen carefully. Uh, okay. And that's a problem because why? I mean, so what? Then we have to go further. We need to boldly assert two things. Not only is this not bad, it's actually a good thing. It's actually a positive thing, and it was in God's designs. That's the first thing we have to assert without hesitation. The church could not even exist if she did not embrace beliefs and practices that came to her from the pagans. And not, and not only. Okay, Protestantism would not even exist were it not for the church. And the church would not even exist were it not for pagan practices. So that's a, that's a pretty bold claim. Um, I trust you're going to explain yeah, to of course. us. <laughs> and, and we always like to define terms first. So what's a pagan? What is paganism? I, I've, I've called my kids pagans uh, on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just little heathens until they're baptized. Okay, so um, one of your best resources that you can find on the internet is the Catholic Encyclopedia. And so we go to the Catholic Encyclopedia for the definition of what a pagan is. In the broadest sense, paganism includes all religions other than the true one revealed by God, and that is only the Catholic faith. That's in the broadest sense. In a narrower sense, it includes all religions except the three predominant monotheistic Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Mohammedanism, Islam, okay? The term is often used as the equivalent of polytheism, belief in the existence of multiple gods, but that's not, that's not an essential characteristic of the pagan. So since we're going down this, this road of pagans and terms and, and so forth. Adam and Eve believed in the one true God, but by the time of Noah, even though he still believed in the one true God, polytheism had taken root. So what had happened in that, that lifeline? The, this, of course, is all due to concupiscence and the darkened intellect of man, both consequences of original sin. So God had eventually revealed himself to Abram, Abraham. What did Abraham believe? <laughs> he was a pagan. <laughs> he literally had pagan origins. Abraham had pagan origins. You're going to have to talk us through it. So, I, I mean, he was literally a pagan. He was an idolater. This is clear from Scripture. In the book of Joshua, chapter 24, the second verse, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, your fathers, referring to Abraham and the father of Abraham, your fathers dwelt of old on the other side of the river, river, the Euphrates, and they served strange gods. Abraham and his dad worshipped the moon. Not kidding. So the father of our religion. Yeah, had pagan origins. <laughs> so so he he had been a pagan. I mean it And we're certainly it, not a Christian. Yeah, in the in the literal definition of the word, he he had been a pagan. Been a pagan. Um so clearly, I guess the, the point here is even though he had pagan origins, um uh, Judaism had pagan origins that uh, clearly doesn't invalidate the the Judaism he founded in his covenant with with the Lord. Why should it? So that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so people who are you know obsessed with pagan origins everywhere, what what is it that they're thinking? 
Well, I mean, strictly speaking, they're think they're thinking illogically. There's an implicit logical syllogism in play here. So the major premises, all pagan religions are erroneous to some extent. What pagans believe and do is wrong to some extent. Doing what pagans do is wrong. Believing what pagans believe is wrong. Major premises. Minor premises. Catholics do things that pagans did. Catholics believe things that pagans believed. And so from that, they conclude that Catholics are wrong. Yeah, so they imagine. So where's the where's the fallacy here? So principally, there are two fallacies. While some of what pagans do and believe is wrong, not everything that pagans did and believe is wrong. So that's that's the first problem. The second problem is even, even those things that are wrong, and they did things that are wrong, often have a great deal of truth in them, truth that ought to be emulated. And we have this, this crazy idea that, that pagans are just like this evil, evil people. The contrary is true. The contrary is true. They did things in many cases that were very evil. They did things in many cases that were simply wrong. But they weren't entirely wrong-headed. So three words come to mind. A pinch of incense. I, you, you oftentimes hear this, especially in traditional circles, fundamentalist circles. But everybody jumps to, hey, it's a pinch of incense. Just It's a tiny little thing, but but it's still a thing. And, and I guess what you're saying here is the distinction you're making is that a, a Catholic can safely adopt a pagan practice or even a belief so long as it's not inherently evil. And there's, 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 there's a tremendous amount of truth in the things that pagans did. And we're going to talk we're going to talk in a bit about why those things are in their beliefs, why they were in their cultures, because Adam knew everything he needed to know, and he passed a great deal of that on, and it stayed within the race, but it also got perverted, it got distorted, and in some cases it got, it got distorted terribly, but wasn't entirely wrong. Can we walk through some example, uh, a few examples of pagan practices that are of a religious nature, but are widely embraced, not just by Catholics, but by non-Catholics today? It, 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 it's inescapable. It permeates life. I mean, in the simplest of things, in almost every language, the days of the week are named for for pagan gods. I mean, Sunday is obvious. It's named for the sun, for heaven's sake. What were you thinking? Monday is named for the moon. Moon day. Montag in German and the Germanic languages. Moon day. But in the in the Latinate languages, you have lundi, lunedi. In Italian, lunedi, the day of the moon. Tuesday is named for the god of war. That's Mars in, in various languages or Tubes. So Mars being the Roman god, Tuus being um, a, a northern god. Wednesday is named for the god Mercury, Mercoledì in Italian, or the, the equivalent god among the Norse gods, Odin. So Odin's tag is Wednesday. Thursday is Thor or Jove, Jovedì in Italian. It's the same guy, all right? Friday is named for the god of sex. It really is. Venerdì. It's named for Venere, which is Italian for Venus, Latin for Venus. Um, Freak, F-R-I-G, in the Germanic languages. Friday. Saturday is named for the Roman god Saturn. You can't live without, in a sense, an implicit homage to pagan gods. Yeah, and, and it occurs to me as I'm listening to you that we would see this in a lot of places in our culture. It's Clearly, it's the same for planets, months of the year. Sure. March is a name for Mars, the Roman god of war. The same god after which Martedi or Mardi, Tuesday, is named. Um, likewise, Venus. Venus is named for the goddess. May is named for the Greek goddess Maya. The goddess, goddess of the fields, the planet 
uh, Mercury is named for the messenger god, Mercury. So why did the pagans, I mean, I know why Jews and Christians name things. Why did the, the pagans name these things after their gods? Same reason we do, as a homage to honor their gods. It is a form of worship. So our, our critics are going to say that when we use these words, which have a clear tie to pagan... Pagan uh, origins. Pagan, not, not just pagan practices. But religious practice. Re, pagan religious practices. In fact, the worship of false gods. He, they, would, they would say that's a bad thing, and we would say that's wrong. It is not bad in principle. In principle... Honoring your God by naming things after him is a good thing. It is written on the human heart to do such as that. And we do likewise. Consider, for example, that in many languages now, the name of Saturday, which had come from, which comes from Saturn. Now, Saturday in many languages comes from the word for the Sabbath. So in Italian, in Spanish, in even Tagalog, Sabado, Sabbath, is the name for Saturday. And Sunday, in so many languages, comes from literally the Lord's Day. Domenica in Italian, the Day of the Lord. Domingo in Spanish, the Day of the Lord. So does it follow then that when we refer to these things by using the name given to them because of the pagan gods that we're we're actually offering homage. We're, you know, offering a pinch of incense. We're honoring, worshiping even these pagan gods. Not if we don't intend to. And this, this point is crucial. If we adopt things that pagans had done that were essentially religious, but we do not intend them as an expression of the pagan religion, then, then what is the harm? So... But worship just like any any sin if it's if it's a false worship you're saying it's got to be intentional we can't sin inadvertently we can't worship without intending to this is this is a this is an essential essential element of our faith that what we do that is good can't be it's not meritorious if it's inadvertently good but by the same token it cannot be sinful if it's inadvertently sinful we must advert to the things that we do we must intend the things that we do so naming the day thor's day named for the god thor jove jove di in italian was intended by the pagans as a homage it was worship but referring to Thor's day now, it's not a homage. Not if we don't intend it to be. Now, if you want to honor the god Thor in your personal life, well, clearly that would be wrong. But to, to just use the term, why would that be wrong? Yeah, so if, some, if somebody was out there actually living, and, and I suppose it is possible that this person exists who has studied up on this issue, has discovered like you have the, the origins, the pagan origins of the, these names of the week. And then they glorify it in that saying, hey, I didn't know this yesterday, but now I do know it. And now I can I can honor these gods every time I say the name. Then, right. of course, that person would be engaging in right. it, idolatry. It, it'd be a sin against the first commandment, right? Yes. And, and yet, you know, it occurs to me that uh, it was the 16th century that Pope Gregory redid the calendar, but they'd been using the Julian calendar, which pagan origins, right? Julius. Right. So he had the opportunity, if he was concerned about the pagan origins of the names of the months and the names of the days of the week, he was about to make a dramatic changed. change he could have for changed. all of yeah for all of Christendom. He could have said, "We're making this change for these reasons." And oh, by the way, we're getting rid of all the pagan origins here. New names of the days of the week and months. 
he was no modernist. He could have done that if it was of any concern to him, right? If it made any sense at all. And it just doesn't make any sense at all. Okay. So we've demonstrated the idea that Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, is in fact derived from Samhain. Is but, not. Or, excuse me. We've, we've falsified that statement that, that, all Hallows Eve, Halloween is derived from Samhain. Halloween preceded it by hundreds of years. But there are practices associated with Halloween that do have associated pagan antecedents. So what would our what would our response be? Now, remember this. Our response should be, uh, so what? That is a problem because why? I mean, why? The fact that pagans did something does not mean it is inherently wrong. If we dispensed everything in our lives that has a pagan antecedent, there'd be nothing left of our culture. There will be nothing left of our religion. Yeah, that's that's true. So it, it, like so many things, it gets back clearly to the essence of a, of a thing. What is this thing? Is this thing essentially evil or contrary to our religion or is it like the theologians would say accidental boom so that's the nub of the matter so let's let's move on from halloween christmas is another one that comes under heavy criticism for uh, pagan origins so most of it's rubbish um the idea <laughs> the idea there, there is in this, you want to understand how to think like a Catholic thinks? Here is a perfect example. The idea that the celebration of Christmas is derived from the pagan feast of Sol Invictus has no basis in history. And to be very frank, it's just moronic. But in fact, how, how do we how do we know that? Because I I hear from people all the time, Jim, who say, Oh, you and Jim get together on the show and he just spouts off. Old white guys. <laughs> he, he's Yeah, old white guys. And Jim in particular is a cranky old man. And, um, you know, he just says whatever, you know, comes to mind on this stuff. Is there any basis, like, like what could you point to to support the notion that Christmas, for example, is not actually derived from a pagan feast, or that it is, and there's some other explanation. So here's the thing, Jeff. The assumption is, the assumption has to be that it's not. And it's impossible to prove that th there's no documentation, at <laughs> con con contemporary documentation that says it's not. It's on the knuckleheads who say that it is to demonstrate that it is. And this cannot be demonstrated. The fact that these two things occurred roughly at the same time just happens to be a coincidence. But, but, and here's, here's the part where we get to how to think like a Catholic. I don't, so, I don't like coincidences. So gotta be more, <laughs> be more to it. <laughs> so several of the church fathers at John Chrysostom, prominent among them, made the observation that the nativity of our Lord happened by God's design to coincide more or less with this pagan feast. And John Chrysostom in his writings said, I basically, I'm paraphrasing here. How cool was that? I mean, wasn't it cool that the pagans were celebrating this midwinter, this winter feast at the depths of the darkest of nights at exactly the same time when our Lord would fix it from the cosmos to have his son born. And so rather than say, okay, two things happen at, this, at the same time, there, there must be cause and effect, which is moronic. Instead, they would say, this was almighty God preparing us to celebrate the birth of his son by allowing mankind to institute 
this other feast in the dead of winter so that when he chose to bring his son into this world, that would coincide with this other feast. And so mankind was used to celebrating this feast. It was a very, very easy transition. So there's this, uh, there's this kind of concept in Catholicism in terms of thinking like a Catholic, where we, we see in these, these, uh, they're not coincidences. They are, they appear to be actually divine will where we are Catholicizing the the world, the earth, humanity, uh, by replacing these pagan feasts with a far higher feast, a true not not only a true feast, but a true feast in honor of the true God, and uh, something far mo more momentous than Sol Invictus or the Sol Invictus, which in the in the final analysis is a bit of a stupid thing to celebrate, right? Yeah, or or the yeah the winter equinox or however they looked at it. It's not just a Christmas thing, though, right? We're looking at, at when we talk about Easter, you know that 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 was a replacement of of uh, Jewish feasts, and then again in Pentecost, the very word was was rooted exactly in, in I mean, Judaism. Uh, so clearly, practices associated with Christmas that do have so so the first thing we could say is no no we falsify the assertion that. Christmas is derived from Sol Invictus. But there are practices associated with Christmas that do have pagan antecedents that Christmas, these, these customs associated with Christmas are derived from. I mean, there's Christmas trees, there's the ornaments on the Christmas tree, the Advent wreath, mistletoe, the Yule log, Santa Claus himself. Every one of them has a clear pagan antecedent from which they are derived. It's worse it's, than that. You yeah, good. There, there's there's even more. If you, I, I know you've put together a list. There's stuff that everybody does that nobody would think twice about that, in fact, or would be on that list of pagan antecedent practices, right? Right. Gift giving. A midnight worship service. Whoa. <laughs> how, how crazy is that? I mean, candles. The use of candles in worship. It, <laughs> I don't know. I, all right. The nativity scene, the idea of the nativity scene comes to us from St. Francis. But I got to tell you, <laughs> the idea of figurines to celebrate feasts is as old as mankind. It is not. It's totally pagan in its origins. And so I got to ask, Jeff, when the haters, now I'm going to quit, now I'm going to ask you, when the haters launch their attacks, what should the response be? Yeah, I, I think you've proven the response should be, so what? Why Why is that a problem? Nailed it. <laughs> you were talking about Easter. I mean, it's the same story as Christmas and Halloween. No, the celebration of Easter is not a pagan celebration of the equinox. So, I mean, that's even, that's even particularly stupid. I'll tell you why. So the equinox is inherently a solar phenomenon, all right? I mean, by definition, it's determined by the solar calendar. The date of Easter is determined primarily by the lunar calendar in its relationship to the solar calendar. So the idea that somehow Easter is a, is a celebration of the equinox is I mean, it's just stupid. I mean, if that were the case, why wouldn't it just be on the equinox? I think. So let's let's talk about this question because you're talking about calendars. Um, it's all about astronomy, right? Oh, <laughs> more uh, pagan uh, stuff, right? You know, uh, lunar things, solar things. You know, this is starting to sound a little bit iffy. You've admitted that the word Easter is is driven by these events. So what? Let's talk about the word Easter itself. Pagan. Uh so th th there is no question that that it there are derivatives in the catholic faith from pagan practices but when they're not then they're not the word easter has no relationship to the pagan goddess ishtar 
There's just there's just no basis in history for this. The crazy thing is the word Easter only exists in any case in the Germanic languages. In all the other languages of the world, the word for Easter is typically derived from the Hebrew for the Pasch. So you have um, Pascha, Pasqua, and, and similar cognates in all of the other languages. It's just in the Germanic languages. And it's not exactly clear where that comes from, but one thing is absolutely certain. No one has ever demonstrated an actual, plausible, etymological connection between Ishtar and Easter. The only thing that they have in common is they, if you really work hard at it, sort of sound similar. If you work really hard at it. <laughs> but the poets would call that forced rhyme, right? Yeah. So... What about some other customs? Because as it relates to Easter or Pasqua, um, there are a lot of customs that we kind of look at and say that has no relationship to the suffering and death of our Lord, no relationship to the resurrection. So can we talk about some Easter customs? So um, Easter bunny, Easter baskets, these things are essentially cultural rather than religious and they're unapologetically pagan in origin there's no question so the easter <laughs> if even even pope francis made mocking traditionalists no, no really mocking traditionalists because they they reproduce like rabbits all right so it's it's axiomatic <laughs> jeff 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 Kaffman doing his part all right. Yes, I, so, I raise I raise rabbits. I, I know <laughs> I know what they're capable of, and I, I would like to tell all of you listening: if it is your, if it's your calling, if it's your duty in life, yes, you can learn from those rabbits, uh, despite <laughs> what the, the Holy Father thinks. Actually, the, the the biology behind rabbits and their ability to reproduce is actually it's it's divine. It's it's incredible. But but here's the point. So rabbits being capable of reproducing prolifically are historically a symbol of new life. Makes perfect yeah. sense because what is it that the resurrection represents for us? New life. So you have this idea of new life in the spring. It's not by accident that the Passover happened in the spring, according to the lunar calendar, it's not by accident that the date of Easter is based on the date of the Passover and that all of these things happen exactly at the time of the year in the Northern Hemisphere where the thing that's happening is new life. So Easter eggs ooh, gotta be, you know, I mean, Jesus was... I mean, there's no egg involved there. I don't really see the the relationship, right? I'm trying to steel man the argument here. Um, you know, painting eggs. There's got to be, you know, like the the pagans must have painted face paint before they were going into battle or before they were offering up virgins for sacrifice. There's got to be some sort of pagan origin there, right? Interestingly, not not so much. Um, so here's the thing. Back when, when, when Catholics, when Catholic men were real men, and and Catholic women were real women, nobody ate eggs or cheese or dairy, anything, but, any eggs, meat or that, cheese. That's very that's very important to to point out here because we're now, depending upon how far back you want to go, sixty or a hundred years distanced from traditions that our ancestors had that were just so obvious to them that would have answered this question. And now we, we don't have any idea about this tradition because we, nobody, we don't do it. Nobody embraces. Yeah. Nobody embraces those old traditions of giving up dairy and eggs and so forth. So, it, so you know, so they don't see the connection. So imagine you have hands. I have hands. Jeff, you have hands. Yeah. I have hands. 
so they slow down over the winter, but they don't stop completely. And in the spring, they, they start laying more prolifically. So imagine a family of like 14, just to pick a number, 14 children with a, a just a, a whole raft of hens laying eggs throughout the 40 days of Lent, throughout the, the nine weeks, really, from Septuagesima through Lent. What do you do with the eggs? And so they had clever ways to keep eggs. And now, on Easter Sunday, you got all the eggs you want, and you can eat them. And so there's this surfeit of eggs. What do you do with them? Yeah. You, them. you play games. You make merry. You make them beautiful. And beauty was so much more an important part of medieval life than it is of our own lives. And so the eggs played a part in Easter because people hadn't eaten eggs. And, and of course, there's association of the egg with, with new life. But that's hardly uniquely a pagan idea. Yeah, so the... And the egg, of course, is an amazing creation. There's so much oh. that could be said about that uh, from a, a biological standpoint. Nutritional point of view. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Um, we don't need to go there. We've we've got enough to to cover. But the bottom line is, it seems to me clearly, the the haters, and and those that are living in fear of cooperating with some sort of pagan infiltration of of the Catholic religion, they can they can rest easy. They can rest easy. So, religious practices. There are countless examples. I imagine just off the top of my head, I'm thinking in daily life that probably have their origin in pagan practices. A lot of these are simply cultural, not inherently religious in any case. And yet back to the the pinch of incense, because something as traditionalists, we want to we want to form our consciousness well. We we don't want to be lackadaisical. We don't want to just say, oh, it's cultural, so therefore it's okay. So we don't want to err on this. We don't want to be scrupulous. Well, we, we don't want to suffer from scrupulosity. So what if a practice was inherently or intrinsically religious? Then what do we say? We, we say the same thing. So what? That's, that's a problem because why? And when we look to what was good and true in the practice, um, we, we, we can see why we might embrace it. I mean, as just for example, as a homage, Burning incense to a god is a very natural thing to do. There's just something in the human mind that says, you, I mean, it's kind of weird if you think about it, but it's it's across cultures. You take these, these things like the sap of a tree and you, and you burn them and they smell great and the smoke rises up to heaven. Well, as a, as a human, as a homage, burning incense to a god is a natural thing to do. Yeah, there's something, there's something about the human condition and the response to the movement of of God that everywhere we look, we see this people being drawn towards not just the worship of a God, but these other behaviors that are associated with it, burning of, of candles, burning of incense, even, even sacrifice, right? Everywhere we see in human history that sacrifice was was a part of of offering to, to God. So it becomes an easy criticism to make of the one true religion to smear it by saying, well, pagans burned incense to their gods, so and Catholics burn incense. I don't think anybody else does today. I guess the Orthodox probably do. So since pagans did it and Catholics do it, therefore Catholics are bad. No sequitur. It doesn't follow. Burning incense to pagan gods is wrong, but burning incense is not inherently wrong. In principle, in fact, it's good. So while it is wrong to burn incense to Thor, <clears throat> that's because it was to Thor, not because it was burning incense, because in fact, burning incense to the true God is a worthy thing to do. I have gotten serious questions about this, and I know you have. Uh, people write and ask, Hey, I like the smell of incense. Can I burn incense in my home? Secondly, not to Thor. Not, not to Thor or any other false god. Um, 
And then secondly, what if, you know, the incense is named or flavored after some obscure deity or whatever? Can I still In, Hindu, burn Hindus it? burn Hindus burn incense? That's a thing. Yeah. And and so you go to so you go to when head shops, right? You get yeah. incense. It's incense. The fact yeah. that it has some some goofball name doesn't change what it is, and it doesn't. No, it's not. It's not possessed by demons just because it's. No, just go buy the incense, burn incense to your God in your home, and God will be glorified. Yeah, and and I I bet if we put our minds to it, there'd be countless examples that if we wanted to dig into it that we would find in our our faith and in our culture that have some sort of pagan antecedents. I mean, I, 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 everything that matters in Christianity, everything that matters existed and has pagan antecedents. And some of them are really, really cool. I mean, just the idea of wine becoming the blood of a god that absolutely existed in paganism and not only the idea of drinking the blood of a god to share in that divinity it's all over paganism and and interestingly on that one point we know that to be true, not just because Jim said it, but in Scripture, it's clear that the Jews were horrified by I, the idea of eating our Lord's body, his flesh, and drinking his blood because they knew precisely what you're saying. This was something that the that the devil worshippers did. Right. I mean, if, if you look at the the mythology of various religions throughout the world, this idea of, of God taking on a human form by, to use the delicate term, overshadowing a virgin who then conceives his son, this is all over mythology. There's, there's no Christianity without this idea. And then, then the things we do in worship, processions, this, this is just what mankind did. The use of fire in worship. I mean, we think, oh, yeah, there's some pagan stuff right there. I mean, those pagans like burning stuff and having fires and things. Come on. Have you been to a genuine Holy Saturday liturgy? I mean, the crucifix itself. It was the Romans who came up with the idea of crucifixion. Um, honoring certain of the dead as sacred figures. That's all over paganism. This is our, our cultus of the saints. The idea that there would be a, a cast of individuals who interceded before God, priests, is everywhere in the human story. And the idea that when they performed these functions, that they would wear particular garments I mean, just the idea of priests, totally pagan. The use of candles and worship fountains, religious fountains, holy water. You know, it's it's extraordinary as, as we go through the, this itemization that, that you have just shared with us that we, we know that our Lord works in the even greater good in spite of evil. Um, you could also say despite it but he works through that to bring out an even greater good. And we know St. Paul says that the, the gods of the Gentiles are devils, right? So all over the world, for as far back as we can see, there were all these, these false practices, false gods, pagan things. And, and yet, somewhere in there, our Lord has clearly planted the seed and, and allowed it to come to fruition in such a way that wherever these pagans were, there were parts of their practices that they would recognize when they heard the story of, of the tr one true God. They would see in there these elements of sacrifice, of service, of offering, of, of priests, of adoration, of, of public consecrations, right? Those false priests would walk around and consecrate their, their societies. 
So Satan was sowing the seeds of, of evil and trying to undermine our Lord. And our Lord is coming through and, and just mopping it all up. Just mocking it, just mocking it. Yeah. Oh, that's the beauty of it, Jeff. Not only is it not wrong, it's positively a good thing. Yeah, it's 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 absolutely ama amazing. I mean, we we use words like transformation today, especially those of us that are in sales and marketing and so forth. We talk about transformation, and yet, and yet that that word is what's happened to all of creation and all of the work that that Satan has done to mock, to ridicule, to undermine, to lead people astray in our our Lord has come through and transformed it all and established a religion that that just exploited mops, mops it all up. So when we talk about temples, when we talk about setting aside buildings for worship and altars and canopies and sacred art and priests and virgins. Every single one of these things existed in paganism. Every single one of them. And it does not mean that the church derived them from paganism. Man this is the punchline, Jeff. Man did these things because man inclines to worship God in particular and meaningful ways. Thus, pagan man did these things. Then Hebrew man did these things. Yeah, so we we see again, continuing the theme, our, our Lord permits free will. He permitted men to fall into these false religions so that he could then raise up pagan man and make him a, a jew as we talked about at the top of our, our conversation and and now he has raised up hebrew men and made them christian men it, it just followed a very very natural progression so we see for example in the idea of sacrifice as worship adam sacrificed cain and abel clearly sacrificed Noah sacrificed. The Jews sacrificed. And and so we sacrifice, but the the difference is that we've drawn the line at human sacrifice. That men sacrificing other men, that is pagan. I accept that it's not. I mean, our entire cultus, the, the, the cult of the Catholic faith, revolves around a priest sacrificing man, human, the God-man, to his eternal father. There's nothing inherently evil about the idea of human sacrifice. Yes, it was perverted. Yes, it was distorted. So yeah, the, a priest cutting the beating heart out of a man and offering it to appease a false god, I mean, that's a bad idea. But a priest offering a, sacrif a sacrificial victim to appease the wrath of a God who's been egregiously offended, that's not inherently wrong. In fact, there's something very right about it in principle. We do these things because, because God made us to do them. And, by, and, and I mean by that, that he created us. The way everything works is designed, the way we're built, the way we think, the way God made us. The idea of sacrificing a human, the greatest of humans, to appease the wrath of an offended God, that's in us. These things were written on the hearts of the pagans as much as they were written on the hearts of the Jews and as much as they are written on the hearts of the Christian. One point I want to make about this... For, for new Catholics or Catholics who've never thought about this deeply, um, sometimes they're they're uncomfortable with what we've just talked about, the sacrifice of of a man to appease the wrath of God. Of course, God gives all life. It's a gift from him. It, it's a it's his to withdraw whenever he wants Lord, to give it and the Lord taketh away. Right, we we all will die. It's just a matter of time and, and place. But when the when the priest offers up that that host, that sacrifice, it's not a new sacrifice. It's not a different sacrifice. He is he has been enabled by God by Christ, who said, "Do this in memory of me." He is representing that one sacrifice on Calvary that 
occurred between the will of the father and, and the son. And, and we can kind of step back in time, right? We can't all have been there at the foot of the cross, but we are kind of enabled to, to participate as participate if. Participate in that, exactly. Right, like like John and, and Magdalene and, and Our Lady did. So we've talked a lot about practices, but now that we've opened up a bigger theological thing, what are what are some of the philosophical underpinnings of our faith that we need to touch on before we wrap up? So consider the where and when our Lord lived on this earth. Okay. He didn't just stumble upon the planet like by accident. The exact moment the, during the Pax Romana, the great Roman peace, that that time was was predetermined by Almighty God. Now consider this. Socrates is the father of Western philosophy, okay? Socrates instructed Plato. So Plato was the disciple of Socrates. Aristotle was the disciple of Plato, okay? Now, if you've ever read the first thing by St. Thomas Aquinas, who articulated Catholic philosophy and theology, he's the quintessential exponent of Catholic philosophy. He reveres Aristotle. He doesn't even call him. He doesn't even presume to call him Aristotle. He calls him simply the philosopher as though there were no other. Okay. Aristotle, the philosopher, tutored Alexander the Great until he was 16 years old. Alexander conquered the better part of the world, as we know, including, of course, the Jerusalem of our Lord. And in doing so, he brought the soundness of Greek philosophy to Jerusalem. Now, the milieu in which our Lord lived, yes, it was ruled by a Roman regime, but the culture was essentially Greek. I mean, the fact of the matter is the apostles and our Lord spoke Greek to each other. When we talk about God, preparing the world for the coming of the Messiah, we have to reckon with the fact that this preparation included predisposing man to accept the teachings of that Messiah. And God used the pagan Greek philosophers to do exactly that. So he prepared us to think like Christians and used the pagan Greeks to do that just as he used the pagan Roman engineers to create an infrastructure that would be used to carry those ideas to the world. Yes, Catholicism has pagan roots unapologetically. What else could it have? Before God spoke to Abraham, what else did he have to build on except those truths which existed in paganism because they're true? And it is by the grace of God that pagans throughout history have paved the way, paved the way figuratively and literally for the growth and the enrichment of the Christian religion. It really is extraordinary how our God has chosen to work through human agents from, from the very beginning in ways, that are, in ways that are mysterious for us, even when you understand this, this pattern, uh, this, this formula, uh, how we become cooperators with with his will and his grace sometimes unwittingly. even against even against our own ambitions yeah against unwittingly or even against your will um the the greatness of this god is so extraordinary because even through outright evil he permits it so that some greater good is going to come it's what god does so you, you've helped remind us of a of a very different take on this this whole question um some aspect of the faith you know people will charge it as as having pagan origins it's and it happens to be false but we need to be informed well enough that we can understand when it's false and call it out for being a, a lie but also knowing well enough to say well uh, actually, that part's true, and we don't need to apologize for it. Uh, I, I think it's time for a 
it's time for a robust masculine um, version of Catholicism, you know, to, to resurface. We've, we've experienced kind of the matriarchal society and a, and a feminine approach, or we could even say effeminate approach to Catholicism for the last 60 years. So let's just, let's just say it. Man so, up. It's time to man up. Yeah. Um, some of our beliefs and practices have, have come from pagans. It's a good because of the reasons we've already talked about. God is sanctifying those things that he permitted uh, throughout mankind. And as we've already talked about, he, he planted those things in those pagan cultures to predispose man, knowing what Satan would do to try to pervert everything good. And the, the practices and beliefs that his son would teach us for the last 2,000 years that the church would repeat and embrace, not just in terms of worship, but in terms of culture. And that's a big part of what we're talking about is we... We live in, I think we can say now, officially, we live in a post-Protestant, post-Christian world, certainly in the United States, where we've benefited in many ways from kind of traditional Protestantism, uh, but we live in a post-Protestant, post-Christian United States of America. So let's, let's answer this charge about Catholicism when they say that it has some roots in pagan culture. Let's see say yes it does thanks be to god jim thanks for being here my pleasure yeah it's my it's pleasure. good to have good to have you back um those of you who are listening i i hope you've enjoyed this episode i hope you found it helpful and refreshing uh formative in your faith and and useful in your daily practice of your 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 state in life as always, uh, if you've enjoyed it, please like this episode, share it with your friends, hit the little button to, to subscribe so you'll know when we post new episodes. If you've not liked it, you know what to do. You can find Jim DePiante on Facebook. Oh, tell, tell Jim. <laughs> um, track him down. You'll find him on Facebook. He enjoys uh, hearing your constructive criticism. Uh, we We do not accept donations here. Uh, it's a no grifting zone. Uh, this is a, a work of, of love and labor and, and hopefully charity. But we do appreciate your prayers. So if you have enjoyed it, please, please consider uh, remembering us uh, and your, your prayers, your rosary. Have a mass offered for us. Uh, we need it. Jim, we'll see you next time, hopefully very soon. God bless you, Jeff. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you all for listening. Have a great day.